and welcome to the Collaborative Care and Wellness Division Clinical Grand Rounds today. My name is uh, George Nasra. I'm the Clinical Chief of the Division of Collaborative Care and Wellness. And it's really great to be here in person again, uh, seeing all of you uh, who have decided to join us in the class of 62. Also welcome to everyone who is joining us virtually um, for this uh, clinical grand rounds. Before I introduce uh, our uh, panel and speakers today, um, I want to remind everybody online that uh, the chat feature is disabled. And if you have questions, please uh, enter them under the Q&A section uh, of your computer uh, screen. For those who are here with us today, we're going to be passing on microphones uh, for questions later on. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers today. I'm gonna to start with uh, Dr. Will Pigeon. Uh, Dr. Pigeon is a tenured uh, professor of psychiatry and public health sciences at URMC. He is currently the director of the Sleep and Neurophysiology Research Lab. He is also the executive director of the VISN2 Center of Excellence for Suicide Prevention at the Canandaigua VA. Dr. Pigeon completed a pre-doctoral internship and a subsequent postdoctoral fellowship in behavioral medicine and behavioral sleep medicine at Dartmouth Medical School and an individual National Research Service Award at the University of Rochester. Dr. Pigeon's primary clinical and research focus on, is on the mechanisms, consequences, and treatment of sleep disturbances, especially as they occur with common medical and mental health conditions. He has adapted and tested behavioral sleep interventions in a variety of patient populations, including those with chronic pain, depression, interpersonal violence, and combat-related PTSD, and he trains students and clinicians in these approaches. Dr. Pigeon has received funding from the uh, NIH, the Department of Defense, the VA, private foundations, and industry sources. In terms of clinical work, Dr. Pigeon has spearheaded the integration of behavioral health and more specifically CBT for insomnia into the sleep clinic at URMC. He has advocated for many years for the growth of this program and for the recruitment of additional faculty and staff. Um, I'm sure Dr. Pigeon will forgive me for not reciting his large volume of publications and scholarly work to leave time for the presentation today. I also want to introduce Dr. Lisha Kudihi. Dr. Le uh, Dr. Kudihi obtained her PhD in psychology from the University of Arizona with an internship at Brown University and a postdoctoral training in behavioral sleep medicine at the University of Michigan Medical School. She joined our department in 2022, this year, as assistant professor in psychiatry. She is currently working as a clinical psychologist embedded in the sleep disorders clinic. She's also leading the development of a training program in CBT for insomnia for faculty and clinicians in our department. Dr. Kudehi has published a number of journal articles and book chapters. She is also the co-editor of a book on adapting CBT for insomnia, published by Academic Press in 2021. Last but not least, I want to introduce Beth Ho. Beth is a clinical social worker currently embedded in the sleep clinic at URMC as well. So they form that team in that clinic. Beth has a long and vast experience in CBT for insomnia. She began her career at URMC a long time ago, uh, when she worked on two, uh, 290, 200 for a number of years, she was followed, this was followed by being a primary therapist at Strong Ties Clinic and another uh, role she has developing a family-based curriculum for mental health agencies throughout New York State with the Family Institute for Education, Practice, and Research. Her interest was sparked to more and more research as she joined the Family Medicine Research Program for three years working in cancer communication studies. As these studies wrapped up, she met with Dr. Pigeon in the sleep research lab 
and was st steeped in the cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia to help out on two studies. As a therapist for uh, over 30 years now, Beth has hooked, was hooked to return to more clinical-based work. And in 2015, she joined the Sleep Disorders Clinic where she currently provides CBTI uh, to some of her former clients and others. Um, Beth also has a private clinic, uh, private practice in the community, and uh, she loves to spend time with her family and her beloved dog, Harry. I am pleased to introduce this team to talk to you today about uh, an integrated approach to managing insomnia, behavioral sleep medicine, and the insomnia clinic at URMC. Join me in welcoming them. Thank you, George. So I will not need to do a brief history of uh, behavioral sleep medicine in, in Rochester now. Uh, I will probably need 12 minutes to figure out the slides. No. Oh, 10 seconds. Um, so three of us presenting today, obviously I'm going first, then I'll be uh, handing the mic over to Beth Ho to talk a little bit about conceptual models for insomnia and delivery of CBTI. Dr. Kudahi will then be presenting some additional information, a case study, and hopefully we get to a segment of her talk that uh, uh, addresses other sleep disorders other than in ins other than insomnia that folks in behavioral sleep medicine tend to address or can address. So a couple of, of acknowledgements. Uh, so George, I'm sorry, I, I, you did say that I was director of this VA center. I, I stepped down July 1st, so I'm not the director. I don't want to get, you know, hauled into some court for uh, claiming that I am the director there, but I'm still um, at the center. Uh, so I have to say, any views or opinions represented here, not those of the VA or the United States government or any other government for that matter. Um, so a couple of objectives for the talk, uh, essentially, I'm not gonna show them to you. So a brief history of behavioral sleep medicine. So even if you're a psychologist where you know the term behavioral medicine, you probably haven't run into behavioral sleep medicine, which actually is a subspecialty. Uh, it was introduced in 2000, and I, I want to go into this a little bit to brag about Rochester and URMC's contributions to this field. So again, introduced in 2000, introduced by a guy named Michael Perlis, who was here, and the first uh, uh, behavioral sleep medicine specialist in the University of Rochester. The, the history of where behavioral sleep medicine comes from is essentially a story of behavioral medicine, which for psychiatrists and psychologists, behavioral medicines tend to be what psychologists think of themselves as, as if they train in this tradition, where psychiatrists in tr this tradition tend to uh, consider themselves practicing psychosomatic medicine, almost the same thing, but has developed uh, separately over time. So BSM, a combination of sleep medicine and behavioral medicine. Um, so Mike Perlis uh, introduced this idea in, in 2000. Um, it, again, from our lab, I, I, uh, I was at the time a uh, uh, direct, uh, what the hell was I? The chair of a committee at uh, a national organization that further promoted the development of this field. We developed a behavioral sleep medicine exam. At one time in Rochester, three of the first 100 BSM specialist certified credentialed were, he, were here, three of a hundred in the world, uh, which was quite a, uh, a flag waving, hey, look at us in Rochester. We had three clinicians in the behavioral sleep medicine clinic at the time. Um, and subsequently, uh, Michael Perlis was instrumental in development of a new society in, in around 2000 Society of Behavioral Sleep Medicine, which Dr. Kudahi is now uh, on the board of directors for. So kind of pretty cool. Um, the history of BSM uh, very much tied to sleep research here. So as George indicated, we do indeed have a sleep research lab. Uh, it is in the bowels of our wing. It's in the basement. Uh, cool space if you can make it through the hallways. Uh, Michael Perlis was the lead there for some time and developed the clinical service of behavioral sleep medicine. I just wanted to note uh, names that were involved in those services, Mark Aloy and Sarah Madison, both in the department for some time. Uh, and then... Uh, Beth Ho, since around for the last five years, has been the sole clinician of our insomnia clinic slash behavioral sleep medicine clinic, and recently joined by Yay Alicia Kudahi, who we 
began to recruit, it feels like five years ago, um, but uh, the recruitment happened last year and she came uh, earlier this spring to regrow this, uh, this really cool clinic of ours, which she's gonna be talking about more bragging. So across, uh, since 2001, every decade, uh, we seem to pump out a, a book. Uh, so Michael Perlis, one of the first uh, books published on treatment of insomnia using this behavioral sleep medicine approach, CBTI, that we're going to be talking about, a self-help book in 2010. And then, uh, as, as Dr. Nasra mentioned, Leisha's very nice uh, book with colleagues, two of whom have Rochester connections. So three of the, the uh, the authors were uh, were here at Rochester uh, at some time for some time. Uh, so in 2030, we're looking for another book. So if you're interested, um, so cognitive behavioral therapy (CBTI) is is the treatment of choice for insomnia. There are now four or five clinical practice guidelines throughout the world suggest suggesting recommending that if you are faced with insomnia as a clinician, you treat the insomnia with CBT for insomnia, not you consider this, you consider that, you, you consider 10 milligrams of zolpidem and 150 milligrams of trazodone. No, first you start with CBT for insomnia. Then if, uh, if that doesn't work, second consideration is the ph uh, pharmacotherapy approach. So this is very nice in practice. Uh, no, it's not nice in practice. It's very nice in theory, but if you have no one to refer to, what are you left with? You're left with zolpidem and trazodone. Um, Sadly, uh, as clinicians, we see a lot of zolpidem and trazodone, and we go, God, if only I had this person two years ago, uh, they wouldn't be here uh, trying to get off uh, medications. So insomnia uh, is certainly highly prevalent for us across a number of comorbidities, medical and psychiatric comorbidities. It's much more common as a comorbid condition. So there's very little, I just have insomnia and nothing else going on. Insomnia tends to be in the context of some complexity, uh, depression, PTSD, chronic pain, and other conditions. It is nonetheless very treatable, but it's seldom self-resolving very treatable, tends not to self-resolve, particularly once it's become chronic, three months or longer, certainly five years or longer, it's not going to self-resolve. It is in addition, once embedded, once chronic, a significant contributor to the development or worsening of those comorbid conditions. Uh, so insomnia in the absence of another condition can lead to a number of conditions. Insomnia in the presence of depression will worsen depression and uh, as I will show, can uh, diminish the effect of very good treatments for other conditions. So a couple data slides before I hand uh, the clicker over. Um, so examples of uh, comorbidity. Insomnia in the presence of PTSD, highly prevalent, probably not a surprise to you. Uh, this is just a very small study indicating that in uh, recently returning veterans from Iraq and Afghanistan, so just, this study was a decade ago, so upon a recent return from combat, that the prevalence, and we're looking at prevalence rates on the uh, vertical axis, prevalence of PTSD, 60%, nightmares, about 60%, insomnia, 75%. Um, and the important, other important thing about this slide is six months later, uh, either with or without treatment, the presence of PTSD diminish, diminishes, nightmares diminish, insomnia doesn't diminish. That's the story over and over when insomnia is not treated. It ain't going away. Uh, just a, a couple other key points. When insomnia is present, it reduces the rate of remission of other conditions. So in this case, PTSD, treat the PTSD far less likely to remit if insomnia is present and untreated. Makes sense. It's, a, it's, an, it's another issue uh, that is contributing in some ways to some of the PTSD uh, uh, criteria or symptoms. Uh, second story I'm going to tell about comorbidities, insomnia and depression, not, supplies, not surprisingly highly co-existing, highly prevalent, right? So eight, 70 to 80% of someone with, of people with MDD will have insomnia, clinically meaningful insomnia. What's more important, I think, is that even in the absence of depression, the presence of insomnia, this is a 12 studies that assess people at baseline and then two to three years later for a number of conditions. All of these are folks who are absent depression 
at baseline. And what the bars show is the relative risk of developing depression two to three years later if insomnia is present at baseline. So insomnia present two to three times more likely to develop depression two to three years later than if you don't have insomnia. Uh, and this, I'm sorry, I'm, it's a meta-analysis with twice the number of studies showing exactly the same thing. And the last slide, the last diagram here, important because this was a study assessing very similarly um, people with and without depression, people with and without insomnia at baseline. Looking at only those with depression who then get treated and successfully treated for depression, they were less likely to remit if they had insomnia at baseline. So two to three times less likely to remit from depression following good depression care management if you have insomnia that's untreated. So I, I, I will not beat that drum anymore, uh, but I, hopefully you heard the drum beat. Uh, you, if insomnia is present, you gotta treat it. So how to treat it? I said cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, so why? Because it's been delivered to a variety of these co of patients with these comorbid conditions and it works. It works for insomnia. It's consistently found to improve sleep across a wide swath of comorbidities and widely found to especially improve mood as a secondary benefit or aim without necessarily addressing uh, depression. So two examples of doing this in a research trial. This is with veterans who had suicidal ideation as well as either depression or PTSD, so fairly complex folks. What you're looking at is light bars baseline, dark bars post-treatment scores, and here insomnia severity. TAU treatment as usual, so no treatment compared to CBTI, so a large reduction in insomnia severity, which we expected when you deliver an insomnia treatment. So that's good news. The better news is same story with respect to depression. So a large decrease in depression by simply treating insomnia and a not so large, but still a decrease in suicidal ideation severity when you treat insomnia alone without doing anything else. Study number two coming up um, here with uh, mainly women in, uh, who had a recent exposure to interpersonal violence. They also met criteria for both MDD and PTSD. Again, a pretty complex sample. Here again, we deliver CBT for insomnia compared to nothing, just a control condition. Here again, uh, similar uh, outcomes with respect to insomnia. So you'll see control, not much change, CBT for insomnia, uh, a decrease of almost 50% in insomnia severity. Depression severity, similar story, very large effect. These effects, by the way, on depression are similar to the effects that we get from pharmacotherapy for depression or CBT for depression by not even addressing the depression. So uh, PTSD severity, not as large a gain, but still a decrease in PTSD severity. Uh, so that's the second drum I'm beating. If you do treat the insomnia, you tend to improve insomnia with CBT for insomnia. You tend to improve mood and maybe a couple of other things on the way. So certainly global functioning if we were to measure that, et cetera. So uh, CBTI sounds great, Beth. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about what it is? That's it. All righty. Well, thanks for having us all here today. Um, I just have to say the, the last slides that Will showed, um, I was helping on that study, and that was one of the studies of the two that I helped with that got me hooked into CBTI as a clinician. And I won't go back because as a therapist for many years, um, hearing people say they weren't sleeping well, giving them, you know, sleep hygiene handouts, and then their sleep not, not really improving. And then learning this, I'm like, there's no way I'm not going to stop doing this. It's just, it's a very effective method. So what is CBTI? CBTI is an evidence-based practice to treat insomnia. It's found to be just as effective as using medica sleep medications, except it's done behaviorally and people don't get hooked on the, the medications with it. So um, CBTI is based on the 3P model of insomnia. Uh, the model uh, uh, shows how it goes from acute insomnia to early insomnia to chronic insomnia, and then what do we do to intervene to help it? So the three Ps are predisposing factors, precipitating factors, and perpetuating factors. 
and then I'll go over those a little bit more in the next slides. So um, for pre-insomnia, um, this slide, I like this because it shows at baseline, the blue line is what we all have, some predisposing factors to possibly having issues with sleep. Some might be genetics. There may be some families that seem to have trouble with sleeping. There's not a gene identified, but maybe someday there will be a gene that's identified for that. Um, other pre predisposing factors to developing insomnia might be personality styles. People who may be more prone to anxiety may have more evident or more uh, episodes of trouble sleeping just at times of uh, higher anxiety. Other predisposing factors are uh, per, you know, folks who have chronic medical conditions um, or psychiatric conditions. But you'll see with, that, with the predisposing factors, it doesn't reach the threshold. The threshold is the threshold for insomnia. So above the threshold line, we have insomnia and below it, we don't. Now the next P in the 3P model is precipitating factors. When we have acute insomnia, there's some type of precipitating factor that triggers a person to not sleep well. Um, they could be typical life events or atypical life events. Birth of a baby is one I always use as an example, um, you know, for people who are having insomnia. Most people can relate to that. Um, either they've helped with a newborn or they've had a newborn and it's expected. You're not gonna sleep through the night when you have a newborn. Um, other precipitating factors could be the death of a loved one, a job change. Um, you get married, you buy your first house. Uh, you're wondering, am I gonna be able to make that mortgage payment each month? These are the types of things that can trigger acute insomnia. Um, those are precipitating factors. Um, also, some other things could be you break your leg, you're in pain. Um, once, let's say the leg is feeling better, or the example with the baby, the baby's sleeping through the night, your sleep should return to normal. And so that's where you see it, um, on this graph. Let's see. Oh, wrong one. Sorry, guys. Trying to get this little thing. No, it doesn't do it. Well, peak of that anyways. Um, you know, when you have the acute insomnia, it rises where you, you now are not sleeping well at all. Afterwards, let's say when the baby's sleeping, your sleep should return to normal. You see that, that line start to go down where you, you should be returning to normal sleep. But some people just don't return to their normal sleep, even though the baby's sleeping through the night, you're not. And that's what we call early insomnia, the bottom part of the graph. What can happen when we have early insomnia is we've developed some habits at this point to try to get our sleep to return to normal. We're spending more time in bed because we're exhausted, maybe going to bed earlier, staying in bed later, napping in the daytime. Um, we've also started to do other things in bed besides sleep and intimate activities. Uh, we might be playing on our phones in bed, maybe reading books in bed, watching television, worrying. These are all perpetuating factors factors that will just keep the insomnia going. And that's at that point, you're into chronic insomnia. So a little star added here. This is where we tackle um, insomnia is we address the perpetuating factors. So what are the components of CBTI? Components are um, sleep restriction, stimulus control, as well as sleep hygiene, relaxation training and cognitive therapy. So a lot of people will go to their doctors, as you can see in that cartoon, or, uh, insomnia is very common. Try not to lose any sleep over it. Um, just relax, you'll be okay. Usually not so helpful. Um, you need a little more help than that. So what is sleep restriction? Sleep restriction is when we tell folks, stay in bed less to sleep better. It sounds counterintuitive. Most people will think, well, what the heck are you talking about? You're telling me I should stay in bed less so I sleep better. Um, if their problem's too little sleep, why would you tell them to sleep less? Because um, it works. It really, really works. And we'll, we'll go into a little more detail about that in a minute. Um, so sleep restriction, it's based on a mismatch between sleep opportunity and sleep ability. So let's say a person is spending 10 hours in bed because they're just so exhausted. They're going to bed earlier, maybe staying in bed later, but they're only sleeping six hours. What we would tell that person is for one week, only be in bed six hours each night. So you tell them, be in bed actually what you're averaging your sleep. So they were in bed 10 hours. They've only been averaging about six hours of sleep. And we base that off of their sleep diaries. 
So we have them do a, a week long sleep diary, sometimes two weeks, depends, um, but a week or two of sleep diaries. And then we look at the averages. So we limit, limit the sleep opportunity to, the, to be equal to the sleep ability, the total sleep time based on their sleep diaries. And then gradually we'd have them extend their opportunity as the quality is maintained. So quality in our language is, is um, sleep efficiency. So we use um, Excel sheets, um, look, you know, have, have folks' uh, sleep diaries be put into Excel sheets. And we're looking at that number of how much they're sleeping compared to how much time they're in bed. And that gives the sleep efficiency. So we want folks' sleep efficiencies to be closer to 90%. Um, after a week of that example of telling a person be in bed six hours instead of 10, um, obviously they're going to sleep less that first week, the first couple of weeks. They're not going to sleep six hours. It's going to take some time to fall asleep. Um, through a lot of sleep education, we help to teach them that it's normal to wake up a couple of times during the night. So maybe they're awake five, 10 minutes during the night. That's okay. And then get up at the alarm. Don't, don't extend that time in bed. So the first weeks are pretty rough, um, but after that, they start to, they start to feel better. Okay. So here's how sleep restriction works. I, I love this picture. Um, so with pre-insomnia on this graph, you can see the, um, where there's the, the blue area. Let's say the person's in bed eight hours, but they're sleeping about seven and a half, seven and three quarters hours. That's at pre-insomnia. With acute insomnia, there's some type of precipitating factor, some type of event that triggers acute insomnia. And now they're in bed the same amount of time, their sleep time has, has drastically decreased. The example, the baby's sleeping through the night, but the person's not, they're spending more time in bed to try to get enough sleep. So you see the blue line go up. They're in bed eight and a half hours, nine hours, nine and a half. They're just spending more and more time to try to uh, chase sleep. That's kind of how I describe it. Um, and that's when we see them, when they hit the chronic insomnia point. And so with the uh, sleep restriction, at week one, we'd be telling this person, because you're averaging about six hours of sleep, only be in bed six hours. So do you see that where the, the blue comes down and it's meeting up at week number one? So you can see where that week number one, they're going to sleep probably closer to five and a quarter hours because they're in bed less. So we tell them still stay another week at that six hours. And then you, you begin to see at week two, the sleep is starting to go upwards. The total time of sleep is going upwards. Week three, it's going up four or five. And then at the same time, we're telling them be in bed longer, typically about 15 more minutes a week, be in bed longer. And then week by week, as long as they're maintaining good quality sleep and a nice sleep efficiency, then they would continue to add total time in bed until they feel like they're getting enough sleep and then they maintain that. All right, stimulus control, what is that? Okay, um, this is where we associate the bed with sleep and sex, intimate activities. But what can happen is when people have insomnia, they start doing all these other things in bed, right? Watching TV, movies, they're on their phones, their iPads, Maybe they're worrying about stuff. They're talking, doing their bills. I've had one person, I remember saying they set up their coffee pot in their room, you know, to, a way to try to help wake them up and stuff. Um, they're watching the clock. Um, they're ruminating about things that they're, they worry about. And so what we do is tell them, remove all those things from your room, right? Because we want them just to associate the bed with sleep and intimate activities. So get rid of thinking, get rid of worrying get rid of smoking, get rid of all these extra things here so that you're back to just sleep and of course, intimate activity. So basic sleep hygiene rules. These are good things that you can review with your clients. I won't go over them because I, hopefully you all know these. I think you probably do. Uh, these are good hygiene, sleep hygiene rules, but it's not CBTI. A lot of people will equate sleep hygiene with CBTI, but they are very different as you've probably learned just briefly here. Um, but it's a mistake because sleep hygiene rarely effectively treats insomnia. It's actually used as a, a control intervention in clinical trials. Many people may try sleep hygiene, but then they will give up on CBTI 
So a huge component of CPTI is educate, 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 teach people about sleep, what's normal. That often, like right at the intake, often decreases their anxiety when they learn that. Um, let's see. So sleep hygiene rules don't necessarily have to be rigidly applied in all scenarios. Really depends on what the person's presenting with. But for instance, somebody with excessive sleepiness might need to take a nap in the daytime, whereas sleep hygiene would say, don't take a nap. So the way the model is set up, you do the intake, um, people start with their sleep diaries, you review the sleep diaries and do a lot of front loading on sleep education to reinforce why we tell them be in bed less and don't do all these other things in your bed. Um, so many people are uh, falling into sleep watching television. And they're like, no, 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 don't do that. <laughs> you know, because when you're going to bed, you're like Pavlov's dog, you know, <laughs> oh, good. You know, I'm going to watch this movie now. Um, and we, we don't want it to be that. You know, we want it to be they're looking forward to sleeping. Um, so front loading on the education. Then usually by the third or fourth session, out of six to eight is, is how the intervention is designed, is a brief intervention. But about the third or fourth session, we'd get into the cognitive restructuring piece, because at this point, we're telling people, get out of bed if you're not sleeping in the middle of the night. Get out of bed if it's taking you longer than 15 minutes or so to initially fall asleep. And usually by this appointment, they're strong, you know, they have enough experience where they didn't do that, that we can kind of tackle them with uh, the cognitive restructuring piece. Um, the other component for this that's really helpful is a number of people have cognitive hyperarousal um, that's associated with sleep-related worries and fears. So we want to help them address that. So they're, um, frequently when we see, see folks, they're worrying about their sleep, they're rum ruminating over the consequences of not getting enough sleep, and they, they have unrealistic expectations about sleep. And so um, with cognitive restructuring, uh, we help to address those. Uh, through uh, challenging thoughts, thought stopping, and weighing evidence of their, their worries. Also, uh, you know, depending on the person, we may do relaxation strategies, teaching them different uh, ways that they can manage the physiological um, stress responses that they're having, maybe teaching them diaphragmatic breathing, progressive muscle relaxation, and mindfulness meditation. So with this, I'm going to turn it over to Alicia Cudahy, um, who's going to give a case example. shortness okay yeah hi uh thanks again for having us so um gonna kind of try and show you what this looks like in action uh so we're gonna review a case of a 49 year old caucasian gentleman who came in with quite a few predisposing factors um pretty complex case he is stands post heart transplant a few years ago with um associated chronic kidney disease type 2 diabetes migraines, history of stroke, and uh, has obstructive sleep apnea and uses his CPAP consistently. So at least that wasn't something we had to work on. Also has a history of depression and anxiety, currently in therapy and seeing a psychiatrist and psychologist regularly. His precipitating event that he identified was an injury at work that ultimately resulted in him having to retire early. That happened right around the same time as this major heart attack that resulted in an LVAD placement um, in 2008 and then his heart transplant a few years later. He did have, he didn't have significant insomnia before these events. So in terms of how he came in at baseline, he, this is two weeks worth of sleep logs. His sleep schedule was pretty variable. Average bedtime was 11, but ranged from nine to midnight. Average time out of bed was around eight. And that was a little more consistent, ranged from 740 to eight. Took him three hours to get to sleep on average. Um, middle of the night wasn't so bad. We woke up a couple of times for a total of 45 minutes or so. So his total sleep time was about five hours, but he was spending close to nine hours in bed. His sleep efficiency, which is just, it's the percentage of time he spent asleep in his bed, was about 55%. So you can see there's a big discrepancy here. He was spending close to four hours awake in bed every night or most nights. So his initial recommendations, this is session two after he's done sleep logs, his sleep restriction schedule was 1.30 to 7. Um, 
So five and a half hours time in bed, which is a little more than what his average sleep time is, but it gets a little dicey to restrict less than that, just because I want to make sure people can still get by functioning somewhat. Um, and then was given stimulus control instructions. A word about something like this, this is a huge dramatic shift. So he was going from nine hours in bed to five and a half hours in bed. And there's a degree of salesmanship that comes into something like this. So Beth talked a lot about education, which is a super important component. Um, so you're already doing some cognitive work as you're presenting this because people inevitably like, well, I can't stay up that late, which is easy to respond to when someone takes three hours of sleep because I can just say, well, you're not falling asleep till 1.30 anyway. So what's the harm in just staying out of bed for that time? Um, or you can take this approach of saying, all right, you can't stay up that late. You must not have insomnia. <laughs> and then they will argue that. Um, so it does take a little like a conversation and effort. And it's really important though to spend that time and get the buy-in from the patient because if they leave and don't do it or give up halfway through, then you gotta kind of start over when they come back in. My chart has been a really great like addition to this because I like to tell people like if you're running into huge problems or don't feel like you can sustain it, we can make adjustments in between appointments so that it's not completely being derailed by the time you come for a follow-up. Um, so in terms of his treatment progress, this is his baseline. Do you see the discrepancy? When he came back after implementing sleep restriction, you can see, oh, sorry, the red line is how much time he was spending in bed and the blue is his total sleep time. So you can see them already getting close together. I see patients every two weeks mostly because that's what my schedule will accommodate. Um, so you can see them getting closer together. Through session five, they were getting, he was spending even more close to, uh, time in bed was even closer to total sleep time. So this, he did have some like changes um, over the course of this. We stayed at the same schedule for a while because he wasn't, uh, uh, how do I get rid of it? Oh, okay, never mind. Um, quite seeing the progress that he wanted. So we didn't start expansion until session six, but when we did, he did great with that. And there was, I think a month between session five and session six. So I just gave him the instruction to go to bed 15 minutes earlier about once a week. So that's why there's a big jump. In terms of sleep efficiency, you can see the pattern. Um, he went from 55% up to 82% by the first session. At session five, he had a stressor. So he dipped a little bit because um, he started spending a little more time in bed. Then by session six, he was up to 92%. He's coming back in a few months just to make sure everything's still going well. Um, so that was just a case of CBTI, but what I wanted to spend a little time on is behavioral sleep medicine in general. And Will gave a great introduction to the concept of behavioral sleep medicine. And CBTI does make up a pretty significant chunk of what we do in a BSM clinic, but it's not the only scope of the subspecialty. BSM providers can treat a wide range of sleep disorders using non-pharmacological treatments. Circadian rhythm disorders, which sleep timing challenges, um, people who have trouble using CPAPs, um, and even people who have hypersomnia or excessive sleepiness, such as narcolepsy. And there are empirically supported treatments for all of these disorders. Circadian rhythm disorders, um, in terms of definition, it's a mismatch between your body's intrinsic sleep rhythm or when your body mostly feels tired and wants to wake up on its own and the sleep schedule that's preferred by the patient or dictated by external circumstances like school or work. Uh, we see a lot of uh, circadian rhythm issues with teenagers. This is the kind of stereotypical like can't fall asleep until or wants to stay up late at night and has a hard time waking up for school. Older adults tend to have the opposite. Um, where they might get sleepy too early in the evening and wake up super early in the morning. Shift work is another huge um, case where we see circadian rhythm. It's another circadian rhythm disorder. And this is kind of when a person's dictated work schedule is inconsistent with their natural sleep rhythm. We see this mostly in night shift when someone has to work at night, but they would prefer to be a night sleeper. They'll often experience insomnia um, during the day when they're trying to sleep. and 
sometimes even have excessive sleepiness when, during their work shift. So, which leads to the next point. Um, patients, this can be confusing for diagnosis because patients can look like they have either a disorder of sleepiness or insomnia or both. Um, and differential diagnosis can be assisted by looking into what a patient's ad libitum sleep schedule is. So, for example, how do they sleep on weekends or on vacation? Or as we found out a few years ago, how do they sleep during a lockdown when they're not scheduled or following their normal routines? Um, timing is really important when you're assessing sleepiness and insomnia. So somebody who has trouble falling asleep but and hard time waking up in the morning and excessive sleepiness first thing in the morning could have a delayed sleep rhythm versus somebody who has trouble falling asleep but has no trouble like waking up. <clears throat> this is just a graphical representation of different types of circadian rhythm disorders. So we think of normal sleep as the blue bar. This is approximate like eight hours from 11 to seven-ish. A delayed sleep phase, the whole sleep schedule is put, pushed back. So this person is from four to noon. An advanced sleep phase is the opposite, maybe falling asleep at five, but waking up by three. An irregular sleep-wake rhythm is not super common, but we see it occasionally where you're accumulating a normal amount of sleep within 24 hours, but like in snippets at random times. And then there's non-24, which I don't know if those commercials are on anymore, but at one point you probably saw the commercials. Non-24 is usually seen in congenitally blind patients because they don't aren't entrained by daylight. Um, it's when your body isn't entrained to a normal 24 hour day and you're usually schedule shifts later and later. So you go through a period of time where you're kind of sleeping at night and functioning during the day and then eventually switch. So you're sleeping most of the day and awake at night. In terms of treatments, behavioral treatments for circadian rhythm disorders, um, usually the first thing we try is realigning the sleep schedule by using prescribed scheduling. Um, really two ways of doing that. Chronotherapy, which is <laughs> very challenging and sounds crazy, but it's actually delaying the schedule around the clock. So if someone, for example, at baseline is usually sleeping from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m., it's a lot of work to have them try to get up earlier. Um, sometimes it can be quicker to have them stay up later. So what you would do is each day they'd stay up three hours later. So start with six to two, the next day do nine to five. My math isn't gonna be quick, but and then do noon to eight and so on until they're going to bed at their desired time. And then they have to kind of stick the landing and stay at their desired schedule. Um, in theory, this works really well. In practice, it's, moderately successful. It's really hard to implement, especially when people get farther away from their natural sleep rhythm. Usually day four or five people are really challenged to stick to it. The alternative is wake time fading, which is the opposite, kind of starting where the patient's at and gradually increasing or advancing wake up time 30 minutes or so at a time. So patients waking up at one, do a week at or a few days at 12.30 at 12 and so on until they're where they want to be. Obviously that takes a lot longer because there's slower increments and it can be hard. A lot of times these patients have a hard time waking up to alarms. So it's important to start with an alarm at a time that they're capable of waking up so they can get into the habit of waking up to an alarm and then kind of progressing as they're able to. Um, it's important to Use strategies to alleviate sleepiness, such as prescribed napping, stimulants like caffeine timed appropriately. Exogenous melatonin can be helpful. We use this in a very low dose early in the evening for delayed sleep phase patients. And light exposure, light makes you wake up. So timing light exposure to promote alertness in the morning can be an effective strategy using a light box. Light box are great in Rochester starting really soon <laughs> because we don't have the natural light. I'm gonna, we're almost out of time, so I'm gonna slide through. Do you wanna do questions? You have you can go five minutes more, which will give us 10 minutes. Oh, minutes. perfect. Okay. So CPAP not adherence um, is a big problem we see in sleep medicine. It 
CPAP is the number one most effective treatment for sleep apnea, but non-adherence rates range from 30 to 85%, depending on the study that you're looking at. Most people can understand why, like you're wearing a mask on your face. It's not the most appealing thing in the world. It's not always super comfortable. I have one. I hate wearing it, but I do it anyway. Um, there are lots of reasons that patients don't want to use their CPAP. It can be anything from just logistical, like equipment problems, like getting the right mask fit, like the right settings, the humidity right, to claustrophobia, where people can get panicky or anxiety when they're wearing the mask, to poor motivation, where there's just not a good balance or a, between like the benefits and the downsides of using a mask, even if they don't have problems. Like I said, it's not the most pleasant thing in the world, so they might not be super motivated to use it. Um, reasons for non-adherence are important to address because they can implement what we're going to plan for treatment over time. Early intervention is super important when we're talking about CPAP adherence. There's tons of data that show patterns of use within the first week predict patterns of use as long as as far as six months down the road. Even, there's even one study that's like the first night of use predicts how they're going to be using it three months later. Some home equipment companies have systems for tracking use and um, systems in place to reach out to patients when they see non-adherence, but usually the people providing those phone calls or check-ins are not trained in motivational interviewing strategies or behavioral techniques for improving adherence. So having a system in a sleep clinic for identifying patients who are struggling and getting expediting referrals, getting them in to see a BSM provider can be really important for improving adherence over time. So how do we improve adherence? One thing is removing barriers, um, talking through with patients, like what are the logistical things that are getting in the way? Like, where are you gonna put it? Like, is the hose getting cut off? Like um, sometimes even helping facilitate interactions with the home care company to find new masks or adjust pressure settings. Teamwork is really important when we're doing CPAP adherence work because ultimately as psychologists, we can't actually make any changes to anything, but working with the sleep provider and the DME. Um, in our clinic, we have a CPAP team who sees patients for mask fittings and stuff. So working together to try and deal with these logistical barriers is really important. When someone has pretty intense physical discomfort, um, desensitization is a great strategy. Um, usually just take a kind of exposure-based technique and depending on where a person is coming in. I've seen patients from people who can only tolerate it on for like a minute before they're getting panicky and taking it off to people who don't really have any problem until they lay down in bed. Um, so really kind of figuring out what's happening now, how well are you doing with it and developing kind of a desensitization process with daytime practice to help them adjust and be able to tolerate it um, at sleep. I will say sleep apnea is highly comorbid with insomnia. So that can be a big like trigger for non-adherence because if someone is taking like our guy three hours to fall asleep and then they're spending it with a mask on their face, he was already adjusted to his CPAP before he got insomnia. But you can imagine combining a mask with frustration of laying awake in bed for hours is not a good combination. And oftentimes people will get super discouraged just about that, and that will result in that adherence. Um, motivation, again, is another significant component. A lot of people have attitudes and beliefs about PAP. I mean, at these days, almost everybody knows somebody who has a CPAP. So what are their previous experiences? If they know someone who does great with it, they're much more likely to give it a fair shot and use it. If they know someone that hates it, that's already um, hard to get going. A lot of people, there are fears and apprehensions, and I like to do a decisional balance with people if I get like a motivation vibe. Well, so what are the pros and cons? A lot of times people will have goals around getting rid of their sleepiness. Um, I want to spend more time with my grandkids or things like that. So how are those goals interfered with by untreated sleep apnea? One of the problems there is that a lot of people have sleep apnea for years before it's diagnosed, so they've adjusted to the symptoms and they're learning to function however they can. So the motivation is diminished a little bit because they don't know how good life can be if their sleep apnea is treated. So again, education here is important. And there is no sleep apnea fairy that comes in and puts your mask on while you sleep and then you do well for the rest of the night. Um, just as a closing, this is our clinic. 
We're embedded in the U of R Medicine Comprehensive Sleep Center. Beth and I see patients. I am full-time. She is, as she mentioned, half-time does private practice. See patients at three locations in Brighton, um, at Westfall and South Quinton. I see patients in Brockport at the Strong West campus, and we both do telemedicine visits as well. If you want to make referrals, we are like booked. I think my next appointment is in March now, so sorry, we're working on it. Um, but if you want to send a referral, you would put a referral into psychiatry and spe or specify um, in the department SCLNBH sleep. You can always just put a note that says insomnia in it, and it usually gets around to us that way as well, or CBTI in the comments. Thank you very much. Great presentation. Can you hear me? Thank you very much for a great presentation. Uh, I have one online uh, question, and then if anyone uh, has a question, please raise your hand and uh, I will come to you. Uh, the question online is What kind of strategies are used to help people get out of bed in the morning during sleep restriction uh, phases? <laughs> so this is variably tricky it's pretty individual some people do fine with it other people don't I, I'm assuming this is like in the morning when they're done sleeping um having setting the environment up so that it's easier so making sure that if you have a time thermostat it's turning on a little earlier um having a timed coffee maker, really trying to plan morning routines and distinctive things that you can do every morning. In some cases, I encourage people to use a little reinforcement. Like if you get up on time, you can have a special breakfast sandwich or um, you'll have time to work out. Like what are the persons like, why do they, I usually let the patient, I think both of us, you let the patient pick the wake up time. So ultimately they're deciding what their wake up time is based on what their social or environmental needs are. So there's some intrinsic motivation there because they chose it for a reason and trying to highlight like, well, you, you picked this, why did you pick it? Reminding them of that and encouraging those like strategies to enhance that motivation. I, I, I tend to also, I'll use like the Marshallinian approach and say, you want your life back, don't you? You know, you want, you want the life that's worth living. Um, so you need to stabilize your sleep pattern. That's one of the things I'll say. I imagine also the environment, uh, uh, as you mentioned, uh, or maybe Richard mentioned the uh, lights, or, uh, and, and there are some timers now on those light boxes. Uh, yeah, um, yeah, there are timers on all sources. They have dawn simulator, like alarm clocks, which is not the same as a light box. It's not like the same bright light that a light box puts out. But there are strategies like that, like where your lights turn on at the same time every morning, and then you don't want to sit there in the bright light. So I'll ask a question for us, um, so, and I'm trying to think of uh, patients that you all might see. So one question is, hey, what do you guys think about melatonin? And, uh, and the answer is, we hate melatonin because uh, it's not FDA regulated. You never know what you're buying. So over the counter, it says 10 milligrams on the bottle. It could be anywhere from two to 20. The, des the uh, desired dose or the recommended dose for use of melatonin is 2.5 milligrams. 0 0.5 is effective and you can't find anything on the shelves for 2.5 milligrams. It's only 2.5 and above. Number two, uh, melatonin is a chronobiotic um, that uh, is designed to alter circadian rhythm. However, there's a phased response curve so that if you take it at certain times of the day, it's completely inert. If you take it a different time of the day, it will advance your circadian rhythm by two to three hours. If you take it an hour later, it will delay your circadian rhythm by two or three hours. So if you're actually buying something that actually has melatonin in it and you're taking it at the wrong time, you might completely screw yourself up. Uh, what about people who say it works for me? Well, there are people for whom anything will work. That's why we have a placebo response literature. And if it works for you, party on, um, just keep doing what you're doing. But if it's not working, then don't up the dose for God's sakes. Uh, that was a good question. Any other? <laughs> Just one other thing about melatonin. It's a hormone. Our bodies make it. And it basically, it's triggered by, or it's released when the sun goes down. So when you take exogenous melatonin, you're, you're just yelling louder. Like it's getting dark out, which is then supposed to like 
trigger sleepiness, but it's not a sedative. I think a lot of people take it as if it's a sedative and that's not really what it does. What about nightmares, Alicia? Can we treat nightmares? We can treat nightmares. I didn't put that in my list, but there's a validated treatment called imagery rehearsal therapy, which is kind of exposure based and retraining your brain to kind of control your dreams or empowering you to change your dreams. Yeah, so as some of you may know, there's uh, there's one medication uh, uh, with some evidence for nightmare treatment that's prazosin. So it's an old antihypertensive medication, doesn't work, not prescribed for hypertension, but used um, for nightmare. It can help with folks. Um, we're not providers, we can't give advice, but hey, uh, summarizing the literature, if it's not working at uh, two milligrams, try four, six, eight, ten 10 until somebody has hypotension and, you know, has a serious adverse event. So um, don't go to that point. You can push pres you can push prazosin pretty far. Um, but imagery rehearsal therapy works as well as prazosin and, uh, and these folks do that. Oh, right there. Question. <laughs> we'll repeat it if you can't get it on. <laughs> yeah so i think education is a big thing there like and what i always tell people is like it's very normal to wake up during the night and there are lots of conditions like chronic pain is another one where if you have significant chronic pain, there are going to be times where you wake up because of pain. To the extent that you're able to get back to sleep easily, like that's okay. Like, especially when it can be anticipated. Like, if you're educating your patients, like, yeah, you're taking this med and you're going to have to pee more, but you should go back to bed and hopefully fall asleep quickly, then that is what it is. And there's nothing inherently wrong about getting up to pee multiple times a night. When it turns into the more insomnia or psychological problems, when there's stress related to that or trouble returning to sleep. And CBTI is great at reducing the amount of time people spend asleep at night, even in the context of awakenings caused by a comorbidity. Yeah, if I can just underscore that, Alicia, so exactly what you said. So um, many people will believe that <clears throat> uh, if they wake up, that's poor sleep, right? So, so exactly that, it's fine to wake up three or four hours a night, but if you can go back to sleep, then you go back to sleep. Um, so a couple other questions, if we have time, how can you help, how can you help clients avoid daytime napping when they're so darn sleepy? <laughs> but I, I tend to explain to people about the circadian uh, process that it's normal to wake up a couple of times during the night. And it's also normal to get sleepy a couple of times in the afternoon. It'll pass in 10 or 15 minutes. Start with that. So that's just our natural circadian process. And that's part of the psychoeducation that we provide for them. The other is if they're sleeping like five hours or less, we actually will prescribe nap times for them, 20 to 30 minutes tops before two in the afternoon. And after 12. You, the main thing about naps is you want it to be in the middle of your wake period. So you're not extending sleep on either end. And you want it to be less than an hour or less than 45 minutes to avoid any, like being too rested when it's bedtime. Yeah, so if I can keep harmonizing on that point. Um, so very important uh, also uh, the, the sales pitch component. So if this is someone who, uh, had, who naps uh, a couple times a week, then the sales pitch is, 
you're real, you're with us for four or six weeks. Can you just give me four or six weeks without the nap? I know you can. Um, let's just do it for a month. If this is someone who sleeps two hours every afternoon and has done so for 10 years, completely different story, then it's, hey, can you give me a 30 minute nap that is scheduled uh, every day as opposed to no naps at all, which Leisha brought up earlier, like sometimes no napping is, is not the rule. Right. Can, oh, can we provide our PowerPoint slides? I assume yes. Very good. So uh, there's a beautiful insomnia full service uh, clinic, behavioral sleep medicine clinic, and please don't refer anyone because they're full. <laughs> We're taking people, they just have to wait. <laughs> Thank you all. Oh, my dad went on one.